All right, welcome to chapter two. This is our preparation chapter, meaning how do we prepare for negotiations? I am doing a live transcript. I might move it around. I might move my video around. I don't know if that matters on your end if you actually see that happening. So maybe let me know uh, if you see the live transcript and if you are seeing my little video float around. It doesn't really matter as long as we get the uh, information across. So we are still in negotiations essentials. We're still building the foundation for how to learn, right? How to learn about negotiations. And then we're gonna move into the part two, which is the skills um, acquisition and development, which is later in the book. So preparation is really gonna be key when you are looking to go into a negoti negotiation situation because that's where a majority of the work will be done. We need to do it to make sure we have the information that we know what we want, who the other, other party is, what they want as much as we can. And then what is the situation we will be negotiating in? Um, as we talked about in chapter one, before we get to all that is the fixed pie perception. So many of us are in situations where we think that we have to make concessions. I put a little cue here and I will, oops, whoop, wrong, wrong thing. I put a little cue here, which is, which is something I will do uh, throughout the PowerPoints. Uh, this doesn't come with the book. I'll just throw them in and I will view these as coaching opportunities. I'm not doing coaching with you right now, but um, ask coaching questions. You can self coach on these. So how do you feel when you are in some type of negotiation situation? Do you feel that you have to give something up? Do you believe that there has to be concessions in place for an agreement to come to fruition? Most of us do actually. Uh, we capitulate, we leave things on the table, we are hard-nosed, so we see it as a struggle, um, or we compromise too quickly. And most of the time this fixed perception, fixed pie perception is faulty and it makes us be ineffective in our decision-making and negotiation. So we already know we wanna be in a mixed motive situation, which means there are multiple issues, we call them goals, multiple goals in a negotiation situation so that the parties that are in this negotiation mostly fully maybe get what they want out of the negotiation and we call it mixed motive so to try to achieve a mixed motive situation we have three things going on right we have the self-assessment that's a lot of work and that's what the majority of this chapter will be about is for you to acquire knowledge about yourself and your goals. We're gonna do perspective taking, looking at the other party, the information we can gain around them. And thirdly is the situational awareness. What is the situation in which you are negotiating? So we are preparing because it, we will be better off if we do that. It saves us time. We uncover information, we ask ourselves questions, we identify our preferences and our goals. And so when we're negotiating, we can be more efficient and it helps us overall. Information is key, right? If you don't have information, what do you have? And so when we prepare, that is essentially a process of uncovering information, making us more successful. And if we are in an organization, right, we can talk about ourselves as negotiators outside of work or inside of work and at your employer, you know, having processes and being fully prepared ensures consistency. We now can have shared mental models with our coworkers so that everybody's relatively on the same page, if not fully on the same page, so that we can meet goals more efficiently and effectively. I'm, I know that my computer may be moving around a little bit. I, I have it propped up, so we will have a better view here. Okay, so what do you want? Let's start with self-assessment. We're going to spend most of our time here. The first thing is, what are you trying to get out? What are your ideal outcome? We sometimes call this a target point. We sometimes call this an aspiration point. And so we are trying to identify 
what that is. It sounds straightforward to identify your ideal outcome, but as we know from previous chapter, is that that doesn't quickly happen. We under-aspire, we over-aspire, or sometimes we'd refuse to settle, or we ask for things that doesn't exist in this negotiation. We call that the grass is greener. So spending some time working through what our ideal outcome is, is what we need to do. And one very uh, effective tool for helping you get there is your BATNA. The BATNA is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. The negotiated agreement, that's the one where you want to end up, right? You want to have an agreement that has been negotiated. That is what you wanted. The BATNA will tell you when you should walk away from that situation. So the BATNA is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. This is what your walking away point. We also call it your plan B. You need to have a plan B and it needs to be identified. This concept is super cool. It's been around for ages. Uh, it actually comes from a book called Getting to Yes, a Negotiating Agreement Without Giving In. I recommend this book, right? Uh, this one is by Fisher and Uri, and I picked it up actually. I was looking at it when I pulled it from my bookshelf today or from the floor. I'm, I'm moving things around my house, which is, you know, forever job. Is that it's from the U of A, University of Arizona bookstore, which is what, where I get my degrees 100 years ago. And I would go in there, pick up textbooks for my classes, and ended up, I ended up always with more books than I should have because I randomly picked up books. So I actually never read this for one of my classes at the university, but um, I still ended up with it, which, you know, clearly I don't regret. And so our BATNA then is our plan B. And they should, as you see in our bullet point number one here, they should be factual. This is not what you're wishing for. This should be objective reality, something that you have found out through an uncovering process of facts. Your back is time sensitive. Market changes, stakeholders change. You're going in to purchase a car. Your plan B might be another car at another dealership at a price that you're really looking to pay. You go into this dealership knowing that if you don't get the car for 19.5, you're going to walk away because that other car is sitting in that other dealership at a price point that you're willing to pay. But that car might not be there tomorrow. So BATNA is time sensitive. Don't let the other party manipulate your BATNA, right? Um, that means that we don't share the BATNA with the other uh, parties. They might uncover information around that because we are going to try to do the same with them. But it, the, if they have information, you need to know your ideal outcome. You need to know when you're willing to walk away. In that sense, you cannot be influenced by them in the negotiation process if you know what you are achieving or what you want to achieve. Okay, so don't, we're not going to let them manipulate us. Then we have something called a reservation point. This is essentially the quantification of your BATNA, meaning we're now putting numbers on it. When we put numbers, when we measure things and put number on, numbers on them, they become more easily uh, comparable, right? So it's easier to compare a 10 to 12 than to compare red to green, right? So what we're doing here is we're putting numbers on our plan Bs, you know, so that we can more easily see when we're reaching that point. So how do we do that? Well, you have exhibit uh, 2.1 in your textbook. Um, you, should, you really should have a copy of this textbook and it walks you through this very beautifully. But in brief, in number one here, first of all, you wanna brainstorm all of your alternatives. So what are all your options that you have? that can be your plans B, C, et cetera, or B1, B2, B3. What we are doing secondly is we are evaluating them, right? So how much are they worth to you? So here we are now gonna try to put some numbers on them so that we can more easily 
compare these alternatives. And now that we know the value of them, we are going to try to approve them. I mean, not, not approve, but improve, improve. <laughs> improve them, right? English is difficult for me sometimes. We're going to improve them because the better your plan Bs are, the more leverage and power you have in the negotiations because you can walk away if the negotiation is not suiting your needs, right? So your bargaining position, your bargaining position will be improved if you have better badness. So how can you improve badness, right? We want to make sure that we uncover all the alternatives um, so we know what our options are. And we want to be creative. We want to be thinking um, with a brainstorming mind to uncover alternatives that might not typically be um, or might not immediately come to mind for you. And then... Lastly, we are determining this reservation price or this reservation point, which is, again, this is the quantification of your BATNA. So at what point are you willing to walk away? And we do that based on the facts. Um, and so this exhibit two, one in your textbook, it runs you through an example, read through it, look at the calculations, so that you can do this more um, in a more structured manner. So when we are dealing with this reservation point, reservation price, quantification of your BATNA, here are some things to keep in mind that could mess you up, right? So first of all, we have things called focal points. These are things that are super salient to you they're top of mind for you, but they might be completely irrelevant to the negotiations. Uh, there's tons, tons, tons of studies in behavioral economics showing us that we will anchor our mind on things that is completely irrelevant. Um, ask me how old I am, and then I walk into a restaurant and I'm going to look at the appetizer prices. And the appetizer prices is going to be anchored on my age right? Has nothing to do, but it's top of mind for me. Um, I, I once heard a story that Costco, right? For those of you who shop at Costco, and if you work there, you might know this to be true. They will put all the TVs and huge appliances at the entrance of the Costco store. They don't think that you're always going to buy that TV, you know, the two grand or whatever, $2,000 TV. But now that you've seen the $2,000 TV, those $15 you know, pants are gonna look extremely cheap and you will buy more of what you don't really need. It's an anchoring point, it's a focal point, throws us off all the time in negotiations. Be aware of sunk costs. Sunk costs are in the past. Economic theory tells us only future costs should matter. What you spent in the past doesn't matter. If you were to make the decision today and those costs had not happened, what would the decision be? Don't let the past influence your future. Uh, don't confuse your target point with your reservation point, right? We already talked about that on the prior slide. You need to know what the goal is, what your BATNA is, and you wanna end up somewhere in that range, closer to the target, away from the BATNA, right? And then we have negotiation issues, issue alternatives and issues and alternatives at the end here. So negotiation issues, those are the goals. If you have a single issue negotiation, that's a one thing and it's really a one shot thing. It tends to be a fixed sum where you have to split it up because you both of you want the same thing. That is a single issue that you're competing over. Identify multiple, identify multiple issues, multiple things that can be negotiated over in that same situation. So a quick, simple example here is you know, you're looking at a job offer, right? Salary, if you only cared about salary, that would be a single issue negotiation. But it's not, right? We look at salary, we look at vacation, we look at benefits. All of a sudden now we have a multiple issue situation and each one of these issues can be negotiated over, meaning we are more likely to be set up now 
for a, a win-win situation. For number two here, down here under this orange is the issue alternatives. Under each of the issues, you wanna identify multiple alternatives, right? So, because if you have more alternatives, you have badness and you can walk away. So under salary, right? What are the alternatives for salary? What are the alternatives for vacation? You know, et cetera. And then the last piece here, issue, issues and alternative is that we now look at all of the issues together, all of the alternatives under each is issue, and we are looking at total packages. So let's say you have three job offers. That's gonna give you three different salaries, three different sets of vacations, three different set up, sets up, setups of benefits. And so you might be getting a higher salary over here, lower set of benefit. You might get, be getting a lower set of salaries over here, higher set of benefit. So each employer is now offering one package that has one total number on it that you have to figure out. And that is the value that you're comparing to the total package values of the other job offers. Okay, so we are identifying multi-value, um, multi-issue proposals of equivalent value. All right, how risk seeking are you or how risk aversive are you? So what happens is a lot of the times when we look at a situation as a loss or when we look at it as a gain, potential loss or potential gain, our um, risk seeking or risk avoiding tends to change depending on how we frame it. So we are actually talking about framing here, framing effect, which is well established in the behavioral economics and the psychology literatures. So what happens is we tend to be risk seeking when we view something as a loss. So when you're about to lose or you feel that you're about to lose something, you are more aggressive in seeking risks. So think of somebody in a casino that has already lost money and they're in that frame mind, mind of, <laughs> um, they're in that frame of mind where they're already looking at a lot of losses. So now they're betting more aggressively, they're betting bigger hands because they're trying to recuperate those losses. So they become more risk seeking. On the other hand, we tend to become risk averse when we see gains, when you already have something in your hand, you don't wanna lose it, right? So when you see something as a gain, you have it, we grab it. We wanna make sure we grab that sure thing. And so we become more risk averse. But the thing is, a lot of the time, you don't have an objective gain or loss. It's how you frame something. And again, tons of studies have, have looked at this. And so we call these reference points, how you reframe or frame something. And that a lot of the time, again, not surprisingly, might be arbitrary. That um, reference point is arbitrary, like the anchoring effect that we just talked about. So the example here is, right, how fast are you driving? Well, it depends, right? We can have multiple reference points for our driving. You're gonna look uh, at the information that your car gives you. So that's gonna be miles per hour, right? Or kilometers, which I still think in kilometers and meters, right? That is one reference point, pretty factual, hopefully. Then you might be looking at, you know, how fast are you allowed to go? Are you out on the highway or the freeway? You can go 65, right? So if you're going 75, when you're allowed to go 65, you would say, I'm going pretty fast, right? But then you can look out through the car window and look at those cars that are passing you by compared to them. Are you going slow? If the car that's passing you, it's going 85, your 75 is gonna look slow. So the reference point is actually telling you different things here. You have three different reference points. You have the, the, what your car is telling you, 
what the legal uh, speeding limit is and the, pe the cars around you. So different reference points. So coaching opportunity here with a question, consider recent decisions that you've made. What reference points did you have there? Could you have picked other reference points? And what would that mean for your decision? Right, so think about how you pick reference points and what that means for you. Okay, so assessing your risk propensity, right? There's three sources of potential risk that you can look at in negotiations that you want, might wanna think about relating to this framing effect here. And so you have strategic, BATNA and contractual risks. So number one is the strategic risk, right? So what kind of tactics do you show up with um, to the negotiation? Cooperation, competition, what is it, right? That is a strategic risk, one source of risk. The BATNA risk is that if you have an expected value, which we statistically can calculate, which we did, right? Exhibit 201, right? Expected value of certain paths. The expected value might be the same, but how you actually get to the expected value might be different, right? Because we have different values assigned to different alternatives. And so with the BATNA risk here is that if you are in a gain frame, you are risk averse, you're risk averse because you're seeking gains, you tend to be in a more weak position, in a weaker position, because you tend to give in sooner. Somebody who's risk seeking might actually be holding out. Holding out is riskier typically because you don't have that sure thing in your hand. So again, risk seeking and risk avoiding will get you different strategies at the table with BATNA risk. Contractual risk is the risk associated with the willingness of the other party to honor the terms. And again, risk-seeking negotiators tend to be more creative. They tend to end up with more integrative, more win-win solutions, because when you're risk-seeking, you're willing to think outside of the box more so. And so you are reaching a better in integrative agreement as opposed to settling, right? If you gain frame, you want to have that short thing in your hand, so you're going to settle quicker. All right, we have a few more different psychological effects we're going to talk about over the next several slides. The first one is what's called the endowment effect, and the endowment effect deals with how you, private, you privately value an object. And so what we know from the endowment effect is once you own something, an object like a highlighter, right? You assign this thing more value than if somebody else looks at it. So this is my highlighter. This one has been with me for 10 years and I love it dearly. If you walk up to me and you wanna buy this highlighter from me, I'm gonna put a price on this that you are not gonna to wanna to pay because we just have psychological attachments to things <laughs> Right. Personally, I have them to close. Right. I wait way too many clothes in my closet that I really need to get rid of because nobody would even pay me you know, five bucks for them. That is endowment. We also have something called counterfactual thinking. Would have, could have, should have. Right. So what might have been, what could have happened, what should have happened. So we here have remorse and regret. And this is our psychological evaluation of the actual outcome of a negotiation. Why did I spend that much money on the house? I should have stopped earlier, right? Why did I sell it so cheaply? I should have asked for more or held out longer. So counterfactual thinking is when we, in our mind, think about outcomes that could have happened, that we think should have happened, that maybe would have happened, and we compare that fictional outcome to the actual outcome. And it, this causes us to feel remorse or regret. We are also confident, most of us are, right? And we have something called the overconfidence effect when we think we can predict with more certainty 
things that will happen, right? So probability-wise or st statistically, it might be a low likelihood event, but if you ask somebody, excuse me, but if you ask somebody how certain they are that this outcome will happen, they're pretty certain, even though that that is not true, right? Will you be successful here? Yeah, you feel pretty good about it, but probability-wise, it might not be that certain. We call this the overconfidence effect, and it happens quite often. So when we project into the future, we feel more confident than you know re reality would have it. So coaching opportunity for your self-coaching. When you feel super confident about something that's about to happen, why is that? Why do you think that you are right about this particular outcome? And so what you can do is you can predict what will happen. You feel confident with that and then do it, do it right now, right? Pick something that is upcoming in your future. Think about what you think will happen. Let it happen. Come back to this exercise and see what actually happened. Were you right or not? And then look at the factors contributing to that. And that's a learning opportunity. Okay. All of those things, those were self-assessments. This one slide, quick look at the other party. This is what we call perspective taking couple of questions here for you to consider. First of all, who are they? Sometimes it's super easy. If you walk into a car dealership, they are selling the car. It's trickier maybe in employment negotiations. It's trickier if you're uh, negotiating with vendors, other parties, right? If you physically come to a table, well, the person on the other side of the table, that's going to be the counterparty. Sometimes that's a group. Sometimes that's one person. We don't, right? It depends. Um, sometimes there's what's called a hidden table, meaning there's other people behind the people that you actually see that have influence on the negotiations, but you might not be negotiating with them directly. They are hidden. So when I uh, was offered the job here at Sac State 100 years ago, uh, I was negotiating with the, with the dean, right? The dean of the College of Business is the person who did the negotiations with me for my job. However, the dean is not the ultimate decision maker. That's the president of the university. So here the counterparty would be the dean and the hidden table negotiator would be the president. Uh, number two, are the parties monolithic? Are they speaking with one voice? Which means, are they actually aligned, right? So are they aligned? Do they have the same values? Do they have the same goals within their group and the same should be true for you, right? If you're a group of negotiators, your team at work, whatever, right? You all need to be in agreement as well. We need, you need to speak with one voice. Or do they have disagreements, right? What is going on on that side of the table? And what are they trying to get? Similarly, like they are gonna try to identify your interests, <laughs> right? What are your issues? What are your alternatives? You wanna try to find out what theirs are. Right? So what are they trying to uh, negotiate for? And as much as you can, when do you think they're gonna walk away? What is their BATNA? What is the lowest offer we can give them while they're still happy and not leaving the table? And then um, these last two slides of the chapter uh, gives you a set of questions to consider, to answer, contemplate, to figure out the situation you're in. So obviously, is it gonna be a long-term negotiation or is it a one shot? Remember what we talked about in chapter one, we should treat all of them as long-term even if they're not, because in today's world, all information, communications, you know, actions will at some point surface somewhere. Um, and so something that is long-term or repetitive, meaning we have to renegotiate, maybe you are a contract employee somewhere, that contract is up for renewal, it's repetitive, it's a long-term situation. We can uh, talk about whether it's a transaction, which is a lot of our negotiations, where it's a buyer or seller, or somebody is looking to give or get something. 
uh, but it can also be a dispute where somebody makes a claim, the claim is rejected. And if that happens and it's unsuccessful, we go to court, right? But if it's a traditional transaction and we have this buyer seller situation, we're gonna fall back on our back now we're gonna walk away, right? So sometimes you can walk away and sometimes you have to go to court. That's the difference here. Are linkage effects present, right? Does this negotiation situation link to another one? Typical example is Supreme Court or you know court um, decisions that sets precedence uh, where we don't have laws, where it becomes case law. My lawyers can check me on that, right? So are there linkage effects to other negotiation situations? Are negotiations false or sincere? If they're sincere, the other party or and you are truly trying to come to an agreement. In a false negotiation, for whatever reason, they are keeping the negotiation going, but they do not have a true interest in reaching an agreement. Can you legally negotiate, right? There might be some situations where you're not, you can't even negotiate, right? Labor law, or other situations. Um, is ratification required that somebody else need to buy off or, or approve this, right? If you're looking for a job, you know, the, you know, the president or HR, somebody else might have to approve. Time constraints, right? So we talked about these negotiations being um, time sensitive when we talked about the BAPNA. Sometimes you have a firm deadline, Sometimes your BATNAS change, market change, stakeholders change. Um, so there typically tends to be time constraints. You might be losing money sitting in a negotiation as opposed to coming to agreement. So, so time is typically money when we talk about negotiations. Um, is this a formal contract? Is it a handshake? It might be a cultural thing. It might be depending on where you're at globally depend on, on what kind of a negotiation you are in, but right, you want to know the structure around it. Uh, right now, everything is on Zoom, but sometimes we go other places to negotiate. Is it a neutral arena? Will they come to you? Will you go to them? Psychologically and otherwise, that might economically might have a difference, might make a difference for you. Are negotiations public or private? Who is watching, right? Is it a labor dispute? Is it something that you have with your neighbor? Is the whole neighborhood watching, right? Are the negotiations public or private? Might drive different behaviors, communications. Scripted versus unscripted, right? Is there a norm or a process that we're following that's either cultural or legal or some other way scripted? Or is it unscripted? This is the first time we're doing it and we're just figuring it out as, a, as we go. Is it a one-shot deal where in this one negotiation, you can only give a single offer, are they gonna walk away? Or do you go back and forth with multiple offers? Like we would here in the United States when we purchase houses, right? So that's it. That's gonna wrap it for our preparation chapter. Have an awesome day and I'll see you for the next one. Take care.